first one. Okay. That is moi in front of a uh, Jamestown church, and that hole right there. It, it well, all right. To, to explain it, I need to tell you about that guy in the yellow hat in the corner. He he is an archaeologist who works there, and he was working on and he is working on that hole. To it goes along with the journal of John Smith of them burning down the church, and he said stuff about uh like the church not burning down because it was made of bricks. And so they're looking for evidence of the church that that the church actually burned down because of the Native Americans. So they're digging for evidence about that. Um, and it's actually pretty new. They started it last week. Oh wow! So they are actively working on that right now. And you got to have a conversation with him about what the work is like. Yeah. And what they're finding. Mm -hmm. And did you tell they found the ashes? Yeah, they found ashes in the hole. Oh my goodness. So they were saying there's a pretty good chance of a, uh, of the church, funny evidence that the church actually burned down. Okay. Well, very cool. Do you want to move on to the next picture and tell us what okay. this is? Yeah. That one is a graveyard for people who died in the start in the starving time. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what's interesting about that is that the people who died, sorry, so they buried two people who were about the same age who died on the same day together. So there, so there could be uh, like more than 30 bodies in there. And it it was just really interesting. I I thought it told you about the graves on the on the sign that was you you can't see it there, but it told you about like how the most famous guy in those graves was this guy. It was this teenager who died of being attacked by Native Americans, and they know that because they found an arrowhead in his left femur. You could see a picture of the skeleton and the arrowhead in the femur. Oh my goodness. So that's amazing that they're able to hundreds of years later, figure out some specifics about like the relationship between the Native Americans and those first colonists. Isn't that incredible that they're able to do that? <laughs> and learning about here we go, the site of the first landing. Can you finish up with telling us about that? Sure. That is where the first ship landed in Jamestown. That's where the first boat stopped there. And Very cool. And, and I don't know. I, I remember learning about the James River, so I decided to put that in the picture, too. Yeah, absolutely. This goes so perfectly with what we have just been talking about. The starving time and the James River exactly and exactly where they landed. And you're getting to see it. I think what's especially cool is seeing the archaeologist actively working on uncovering the history behind it. Mm -hmm. And today we're supposed to go to Yorktown. <gasps> nice. What are you going to do there? I don't know. Get, just walk around. Very cool. Does anybody have questions? It looked like Ariane had his hand up. So you guys learned about the Revolutionary War, by the way, last year, right? So you know all about Yorktown. Very cool. Okay. Ariane, do you have a question? He also gave me this badge for the Junior Ranger program that they do. Up close. Oh, can you hold it up? Oh my goodness. Very cool. Yeah. Are you, do you have a question? Yes, exactly. What's the stick that Tig is holding in all three photos? What's that <laughs> for? 
It's just a just a stick that I found and use it as a walking stick. <laughs> Good I question. Like, I just like sticks. <laughs> Josiah, did you have a question too? Um. Yeah. Um. So. Is that, a, is that a river or, or? Yes, the James River. Yes, it's the James River behind me and two out of the three pictures. Samita, do you have a question on you? Oh, I forgot. Now I had a, oh, actually I remember. It's actually for the work, but why did you put Mowgli part three as due today? Um, I guess that was just a mistake. Or, um, yeah, but no questions about Jamestown for Tag? Well, I kind of have a question about the building. Yeah. Do you know when it was built? And did you get to go inside? Yeah, I got to go inside. No fair. Well, and, <laughs> and it had a supposedly knight's grave inside the church. It was cool. You got to see its coffin. A knight's grave? Mm -hmm. Wow. And to answer your second question, the, the church was probably built when they landed. I have a question. Yeah, and um, we have heard that the churches were really at the center of the town, and so it makes sense that they would have established a church very, very quickly, so probably within the first few years that they landed there. I have Alexander? A so, in Jamestown, I have three questions for you. One, did okay. you like it? Yes, it was, it was great. Two, would you move there if it was possible? Sure, fine. <laughs> Three. All right, here's a tricky question. And would you rather move to New York or Jamestown? Jamestown, New York mm -hmm. is too busy. What? Oh, New York Jamestown? Is New York is way too busy. To Jamestown, great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you okay, well, I uh, will... We're out of time uh, for discussion of that, but I'd love to hear about Yorktown after you go there today. So it is amazing that he's able to see firsthand and then we can also experience it a little bit through him. The site of the first colony and the site of our independence as a nation. So we're gonna be hearing all about that and seeing some cool po photos and um, we'll keep talking about that later. Uh, by the way, in history, speaking of that, we are gonna continue learning about some new colonies today. We're learning about the state of Massachusetts and the beginning of Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, which was founded by Puritans who were coming over from England um, to have uh, religious freedom from the Church of England. They wanted to uh, just adapt it slightly. And uh, they established in Massachusetts, but then spread throughout um, a few other New England colonies as well. So there's actually a large number of them. We're going to keep hearing about them all week long as they established a bunch of different colonies. In science, you're going to be taking some notes on the digestive system. Um, and you also have a diagram um, you can either print it off, or if you can't print, then you could draw a version of the digestive system for your notes. And then in Jungle Book, um, Samhita, I just fixed that mistake. It's part two that you'll be doing for today, and there was no video. I was just working through um, some things on BrightThinker last night, but it is updated now. So you've got part two of Mowgli's Brothers uh, to read. And what did you guys think of part one? before we get into our Pledge of Allegiance. Dikshita? I thought there will be more, there will be more, like, like there will be more stories, like you can hear more 
about the Mowgli's brothers, part one. You thought there'd just be more? Yeah, um, and more reading. Yeah, it's, um, they're all short stories. Um, so I know that's quite different than anything that we've done yet uh, this um. year. So uh, Mowgli is um, at this point kind of taken in by Mother Wolf, especially is the one who wants to protect him in the cave. And you're going to hear a little bit more about what the rest of the pack has to say about it in part two. So you're going to hear about that uh, in the next section that you'll read today. Well, let's get started on the Pledge of Allegiance and school motto, and then we'll begin class. Uh, could I have maybe Harika lead us in the pledge? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and a visible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor. I'll honor those honor. things which are good, true, and beautiful. Respect. I will show respect to others at all times. Service. Service. I will do good things, things for others. Excellent. I will strive for excellence in all things. Perseverance. I will fulfill commitments and then pick up for open discouragement. Thank you very much. Please join me for a moment of silence, boys and girls. Okay, let's start on some phonograms and spelling review now. Would you all take out a whiteboard and marker? Let's do some more single letter phonograms today, starting with the phonogram K -s. K -s. There it is. Next, please write the phonogram. Uh, Next, please write. Uh, let's next do mmm, mmm. Mm. 
Hmm. Let's do p. next. And one more. Qua, never use Q without you. Qua, never use Q without you. Josiah, could you say all of the phonograms for us? Okay. Good. I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you, but I know you went through all of them. Thank you. Could I have also Dikchita do all of them? Can you say each of the sounds? Well done. Thank you, Dikchita. Okay, let's move on to some spelling words, beginning with Surgeon. Sergion is the way we think to spell it. Ariane, what, what are those markings? Made it look like you wrote a word with some. <laughs> Quite an unusual spelling there. <laughs> okay, let's write Surgeon. Sergion. Arshav and Marcus, can you show me uh, the word surgeon as soon as you're done? Oh. Surgeon is the thing to spell. Here it is. Next up, thoroughly, thoroughly. You might have to go to a surgeon if you're not able to thoroughly digest your food. Thoroughly. Next up, judgment. You may spell it with or without that E, judgment. Without is more common in America, but with an E is also acceptable and it's more common in other areas. Judgment. Are you guys able to hear uh, next door um, Mrs. Christiana's class singing the songs? I wondered how loud it was for you guys. They were doing conjunction. Oh, you guys missed out yesterday. There was a an unexpected fire drill and my 1130 class had to wait in a dark classroom for about 10 or 15 minutes because I had to run outside with the rest of the school. Fire trucks came and everything, but it was some sort of accident where somebody like pulled the fire alarm. 
Okay, judgment. You may spell, spell it with or without that E after the G. Next up, please write accurate. Yes, Dikshita. Uh, so my question is like, I forgot. Okay. Please show me accurate and accuracy. And then yes, Ty, what did you find out? I'll tell you once we're done with the review. Okay. Is it about Yorktown? No, it's something else. And it's really exciting. Okay. Accurate and accuracy. Please show me the two words, accurate and accuracy. Two C's in accurate and accuracy. Next, two more words, counterfeit and dessert. You might call um, a sugar-free dessert a counterfeit dessert. It's not a true dessert. And my mom has never had dessert in the past five years. She's only had sugar-free, well, Nah, she's had some chocolate, but not much. <laughs> well, good for her. Much, That's healthier. Not, mu not much real dessert. That's much healthier. I eat a little bit too much dessert. It's so tasty, but you only should have a tiny a bit, tiny amount. Same here. Same here. Alexander. I only have two desserts in one month. Sorry, but two in a month. That's great for you, Marcus. Yeah. Who you're crying is my sister. Who knows why she's having a tantrum? So um, having mom's a rough saying, day after a rough night. Poor girl. My mom's saying, oh, Alexander's getting in trouble since you're crying. So I'm like, guys, you need to be a little quieter. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Counterfeit and dessert. Dessert, like something sweet to eat, is with two S's. Think more s'mores, less sand. Samhita? Actually, whenever you said about the unexpected fire drill, I had, when I was in first grade, I had an unexpected lockdown. Oh, that would be terrible. I know. So, actually, we were all working on our laptops. We were, like, doing Dreambox. And then suddenly the speaker said, lockdown, this is real. And I was like, and I started to get terrified. Yeah, absolutely. I hate that those are so scary for people. And so I had to stay locked in the bathroom while... Everyone went to their hiding spots. My teacher stood in the front door, I mean, in front of our door. And then the police officers came and they looked everywhere and they saw that a bathroom door fell on a kid. That's why it sounded like a gunshot. Oh, it's a bathroom door, okay. So then the kid broke a few bones, but other than that, he was fine. Oh, and okay. Well, this is not as serious. Like, but at our school, do you guys remember when people so were good, Chief? Marcus, I'd love to hear from you, bud, but make sure that you always ask permission before you unmute. Yes, ma'am. We had those walkie talkies and people kept accidentally hitting the button at the top. Do you guys remember that last year if you were at our school? It was all the time. Oh. And it made it so pointless because we didn't even know when it was serious. 
crazy. Okay, it's much, much better this year, just so you know. Okay, let's start on a new spelling lesson today. Take out your binder and a pencil, please. Yes, Kruthi? Um, one time, I think when I was in first grade, um, we had this um, uh, lockdown, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lockdown, and um, so um, we thought it was real because, um, but it was just a fake, like, fire drill, but um, so they didn't tell the teachers because they wanted um, the teachers to be prepared too, so yes, they didn't definitely. tell anyone, mm -hmm. um, so, and then we all thought it was real, and then we started to panic and uh, I I had to go, um, we were all inside the bathroom and it was super dark and I was super terrified. And then when I, I, everyone just told it was just um, a drill, I was so happy. I bet, yeah, I hate that they do that when it's feels like it's real because it just would cause nightmares. It's terrifying. So um, anyway, we'll have to move on from other comments and questions for a little bit. Let's get started on our new spelling lesson. Do you guys have your binders ready to go, ready to write? Marcus, do you have your binder to write our new words on? Okay. Now, our first word today is a synonym to counterfeit, or it can be used uh, as a synonym. Artificial. Can you say artificial? Artificial means fake. Just like counterfeit also uh, can mean fake. So artificial, like an artificial leg would be a fake leg if somebody was an amputee. Maybe they lost their leg in war. They would have an artificial leg. So sound out artificial with me. We think to spell that last syllable as artificial. That's that A-L adjective suffix. Artificial, four syllables. Can you sound that out with me again? Artificial, four syllables. First syllable, R, the pirate phonogram. Second syllable, T, I, two sounds basic code, R, T. Next syllable, F, I, two sounds basic code. Final syllable, SH, A, O, three sounds. That's SH, short letter, SH, used after a single vowel that, or er, used only at the beginning of syllables after the first one. And, the rest is basic code. So we're using sh, short letter sh. Everything else should be basic code. Artificial. Pick up your pencil and write it, please. Artificial. Can anybody tell me something that maybe would be artificial? Maybe they've heard this word used before. Ariane, what's something that would be artificial maybe? A pacemaker. Yeah, absolutely. What is a pacemaker trying to be? I think it's um, that and that doesn't let your heart overbeat or um, doesn't doesn't or and it makes the heart beat so you can live. That's right. It controls that heartbeat. The pacemaker does. Um. Kruthi, do you have another example of something that's artificial? By the way, a difference between artificial and counterfeit is that counterfeit is usually trying to be like manipulate, like they're going to try to fake you out without you knowing that it's fake versus artificial, you know it's fake, but it's like a pacemaker or um, like a cochlear implant. Uh, Kruthi? Um, like there could be artificial flowers. 
Yeah, artificial flowers. Um, we wouldn't call counterfeit flowers because it's not like really trying to trick you. But artificial flowers are ones that are like fake made of silk a lot of times. Um, Alexander, do you have another example of something that would be artificial? You know that I love turtles? I so know, there's yeah. This, like, there's this like huge like turtle on someone's truck, like a huge alligator snapping turtle, and then all we need to say is it's artificial. Because <laughs> we knew it's fake. That's right. Tyke? That plant and this tree. Mmm, yeah. Quite a few artificial plants. Oh, one more thing. Artificial flavors on food. There can be oh. artificial flavors in food as well. Mm hmm Arika's got an artificial plant I think she's showing us. Yes, Ty, go ahead. And um, phones, like those little kitty toy phones. Yeah, definitely. Or maybe some of your younger siblings have like play kitchens with fake fruit and things like that. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, my uncle Jan got my got made my my sister a, a gigantic one. Oh, fun. Okay, let's write artificial. R syllable break t. I syllable break, I syllable break, sh a o artificial. Okay, and the first syllable, um, Sahanasri, actually, would you mark the word for us? Okay, first, underline the R, R to find, find it. Very good. And, nothing in the next two syllables, but what about the last syllable? Uh, um, I'm thinking cap, D-A. And uh, underline sh, a small letter. Sh. Good. Sh, short letter. Sh. Short letter. And this modifies a noun or a pronoun. So what part of speech would that make it? Is it? Uh, ad adjective. You got it. Good job. Okay. Okay. We have just two more words. Um, our next word is um a month of the year that's commonly misspelled because of a silent letter. Anybody know what it is? Aryansh? I'm still thinking. Dikshita, mm. do you know it? It has a silent letter. Uh, um, is it February? You got it. Alina, did you know it too? I was going to call on you next if she didn't get it. So February is it. Now, Alina, do you know how we think to spell February? We say February, but how do we think to spell? February. You got it. February. <laughs> now, this is a proper noun. We were just talking about proper nouns in well-ordered language yesterday. A proper noun is capitalized because it names a particular person, place, or thing. Or idea. Um, so person, place, thing, idea, just like any noun. Um, and it is a specific one, so we capitalize February. 
Sound it out with me, please. Feb, ru, air, e. Four syllables. The first syllable is f, e, b. Basic code, three sounds. Next syllable, r, u, two sounds. Using a, u, u, u for the u sound. Next syllable, air is a, r, two sounds. That's just a, a, a. It's an R controlled vowel, so that's what changes the sound a little bit. And the last syllable is E, which is yeah, I, I, E at the end of a word. Pick up your pencil, please, and write February. Yes, Harika? I already know how to spell February because my birthday is in February. Oh, yeah, I bet you definitely know it. February. Marcus, are you writing February right now? This is the time to write. February is the way we think to spell. Okay, February, show it to me when you're done. Thank you so much, Alina. Can we capitalize it? Yes, capitalize it, please. In cursive and... Um, Eventually, yeah, we are gonna write it in cursive, capitalize too. Okay. February, a b syllable break, r u syllable break, a r syllable break, e February. Arshad, would you mark the word for us? Okay, um, the first syllable is basic, and the second syllable, you underline the uh, U. Thank you, very good. And we're also going to put a three on top because it's that ooh sound, which is its nickname. Uh, next syllable, uh, you put a thinking cap uh, yeah. above the R. And, and an underline. Very good. Thinking cap over just the A because it ends up saying a different sound with the R there. Good. And then the last syllable? Uh, you put a three on top of yeah, it, I, E. Perfect. And what part of speech? Adjective. Um, it's a noun, actually. A proper noun. Yeah. Okay. Now we have one more word that has a actually similar um, spelling pattern to it. Where do you go to borrow books? Emma? Library. The library, that's right. Hopefully our school library will be back and up and running next year. But until then, hopefully some of you go to the public library as well. So library is our word. Um, it is commonly said, um, it should be pronounced library. But um, Emma, I noticed you said library and that's pretty common that people end up saying it that way. Um, just like February, but we should be pronouncing it library. Can you sound that out with me? library. We actually do say the er in this one. Library. Three syllables. The first syllable is li. Two sounds, just it, i, e, and an open syllable. Next is b, r, a, r. Three sounds, library. 
Those are all single letter phonograms. And finally, E is yet yeah, I E. Pick up your pencil, please, and write library. Library. Okay, Marcus, it's writing time now. Can you write library? Thank you, Tag. Everyone else, please follow his example and hold it up when you're done. Library. L I syllable break. B R A R syllable break. E. Library. Alina, would you mark the word for us? Yes, please. Okay. So first, do you underline the I. And then you um, underline the R, R and thinking cap it, and then you put a three above the Y. Good. Let me double check on whether that's all included as an um, R phonogram, and yes, it is a noun. Um, actually, yeah, we're just going to put a thinking cap on that A and not even underline it. So it's just the A that gets the thinking cap there. Okay. Let's write these in cursive. Artificial. February, the capital F is like this. And then library. Okay, for a little bit more cursive practice today, I'd like to actually do a little bit from this poem that's at the very beginning of Jungle Book, um, the story that we started yesterday, Mowgli's Brothers. So we're gonna hear more about um, Chill the Kite, who's talked about here. Um, 
a bird from the story, but this is Night Song in the Jungle. And it refers to the jungle law, which we're going to keep hearing about a lot throughout the story. It says, now chill the kite brings home the night that Ming the bat sets free. The herds are shut in byre and hut, for loose till dawn are we. This is the hour of pride and power, talon and tush and claw. Oh, hear the call, good hunting all, that keeps the jungle law. So let's write those last two lines. Oh, hear the call, good hunting all, that keep the jungle law. Can you say that? Oh, hear the call, good hunting all, that keep the jungle law. Now, let's write that in cursive on your page. And can somebody tell me, according to what you read in the story yesterday, why do you think it's important to have a law of the jungle? Actually, let's start off by reviewing. You know how Shere Khan was not following the law of the jungle? What did he do that the wolves were mad about? Does anybody remember? Ariyanch? Um, he did two things wrong. One thing, took over the wolves' hunting ground without even telling the wolves. And the second thing is um, that now he only, um, he only hunts for cattle. And I that's think, right. I think because of that, um, that's why the people that live in the village, um, that's why they don't like him too. That's right. Very good, Aryansh. So yeah, he, um, Shere Khan was hunting in the wolf hunting territory. So they did not like that because the law of the jungle was that it was kind of do what's best for the whole jungle. Everybody hunt in their specific spot and nobody gets into other places that don't belong to them. They need to have that jungle law in place, just like we need laws in society, right? We have the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution put in place to protect it. And then a lot more specifics to the law from that. But those things are in place um, for the well-being of everybody so that everybody is free and protected. And we do what's best for the country. So this jungle law is kind of like our constitution and everybody in the jungle has to follow it. And unfortunately, Shere Khan is not following it. And he's just doing what he thinks is best for himself, but it's not what's best for all of the jungle, all of the animals. So we're gonna see that a lot throughout this book, the law of the jungle. That's gonna come up over and over and over again. Oh, hear the call, good hunting all that keep the jungle law. So it's best for everybody to hunt according to where they're supposed to hunt. That's for the well being of the whole animal kingdom. Not just every animal eat whatever they find and go wherever they want. So you'll see quite a lot of comparison between. Um, this animal society and why we need laws in our um, culture just for people too. So that is, oh, I forgot to put quotation marks at the end of it. That's what we'll do for cursive today. Although I forgot to write um, an idiom for us yesterday. We've been doing idioms on Mondays. So I'd like to actually write that as well. And then we'll switch to well-ordered language. Okay, I think that we've done, his bark is worse than his bite, right? What does that mean if you say someone's bark is worse than their bite? Ty? It means 
means that. Oh, I need I need my charger. Okay, it means that. Like there could be this dog that lives next door to you. That sounds like a really mean. I don't know, husky or something. Then you look over the fence to find out it's just a little chihuahua. So, so everything. So maybe some things that look mean or sound eh, eh, look mean aren't really mean. They just sound mean. Yeah, They're absolutely. Mean. They sound much wor worse than they really are. Um, which could be the case for a dog, or it can be the case for a person who acts like they're really tough and mean, but they're just a big teddy bear on the inside. Just a softie. Like Archie. Yeah, like Archie. Like Archie. <laughs> and then you look over the fence, then you look over the fence and- Just a little guy. <laughs> okay, we also learned the idiom, last straw. If you said something is the last straw. Marcus, do you remember what that means? The last straw. Or you can think of that image of the straw. I, that had enough. I don't want to deal with it anymore. It's your problem. I'm saying it aside. <laughs> you got it, Marcus. Yeah, it's I've had enough. That was the very last thing to tip it over the edge. Um, sometimes it, this phrase is said as the straw that broke the camel's back. Because a camel can handle a lot of little pieces of straw, but once it builds up enough, it's just too much for them to handle. So it's like lots of little things eventually tip it over the edge. And I think that we did let bygones be bygones as well, which basically means forgive and forget, let it go. Okay, let's do one more idiom today, which is called on its last legs. Oh, I figured somebody would start singing, let it go. <laughs> on its last legs. Oh, actually, we've done that one, haven't we? Never mind. That's like. No, but my dad does it all the time. This is it. On I its like last legs. I bet. On I its last legs it. is like a computer that is just about to totally crash and burn. And oh, we've actually Cereal. done one rotten apple spoils the whole barrel too. Okay, I see where we're supposed to be. Rule the roost. Oh, that's a good one. Can you all say rule the roost? Rule the roost. What do you think that means? Ah. Rule the roost. I have a good feeling. Are you on? Do you have an idea? Okay, just a minute, Tag. Mm, I think ruling, yeah, it's something to do with ruling. That's all I know. I was about to yeah. say ruling a roast. Oh, it's not a roast, though. It's roost. Oh. Okay. Hmm, what do you think that's talking about, Alexander? Mm. In my mom's opinion, she would love to rule a roost. A rooster. <laughs> Oh, does she like chickens and roosters? She does not like them. Oh, she does not She's like them. them. When she used to live on a farm, every time she opened the coop, she thinks they would chase after her. So I'm like, Mom, they're just walking. <laughs> well, rule the roost has they to do with roosters, yeah. It's when a person takes charge and they kind of boss everyone around, like Eliza Jane and Farmer Boy. She likes to rule the roost. So it comes from um, how a rooster acts in a hen house. A rooster comes in and they act like they're so much bigger and more important than the chickens. And um, a roost specifically, not rooster, but just the roost is a little perch where a rooster and his hens can all rest together. So it's like a little perch. And because the rooster is bigger and stronger than the hens, he kind of can push them out of the way and take up more space in the per on the perch or the roost. And um, in the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer, um, that is actually where this one came from. Uh, he describes the behavior of a bossy rooster in a story called Nun's Priest's Tale. 
in Canterbury Tales. So, um, oh, there is a variation, I guess, of this idiom um, called rule the roast, <laughs> going along with what Ariantra is thinking. So rule the roast refers to when a master of the house is being kind of bossy in the same way. And they're the one to like cut the meat at the dinner table. So you can say, I guess, rule the roost is what is more typical, but rule the roast could also be used for someone who's like, I'm the man of the house and I'm gonna carve, my, carve the turkey right there at the table. I'm in charge. So oh, rule my, the mom, my mom wishes um, she was like the queen of the chickens and roosters so that, and she could command them not to chase her. And That's like, right. She literally can't even, like, she used to count, can't even eat eggs, but now she can, so. She does not oh, my eat. goodness. She was so scared she couldn't eat eggs? She Crazy. Eat eggs and eat wow. Chicken. Oh, wow. But now okay. she can. Let's um, switch over to well-ordered language next. Once you're done with rule the roost, that's our only idiom for today. Rule the roost. Oh, sound properly, blah, 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 to Eliza Jane, or Eliza Jane says to Almanzo. That is definitely an example of her ruling the roost, especially when That's she was so told to be in charge. That's so improper, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's. Go over some well-ordered language now. We're going to open up to page 194 in your workbooks and do a little songs to review, first of all. Do you guys remember our object prep is, or sorry, object pronoun song? It's been a while, but we are going to review that because we're talking about compound direct objects and a compound, or sorry, a direct object in general can be a noun or a pronoun. So let's review that one. All right, I'm on page 194 in my book, but you guys can just sing along. Oh, I forgot to present. Just a moment. Pruthi? Um, I sort of remember that, I remember the tune. Kind of okay. Like the object of the preposition, the object of the preposition is a noun or a pronoun after the preposition. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that was excellent for the object of the preposition. But um, we're actually going to go over object pronouns, which also... So object of the preposition can be a noun or pronoun. Here's the object pronouns. It's been a while since we've done this. Object pronouns are in the objective case. Me, you, you him, 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 her, it, it us, us, you, you, and them. Me, me, you, you, him, him, him her, it, it, us, us, you, you and them. Object pronouns are in the, in the objective, objective case. case. Me, me, you, you, him, him, her, her, it, it, us, us, you, you and them. Me, me, you, you, him, him, her, it, us, you, them. Me, you, you, him, him, her, her it, it, us. Us, you, them. So those are the object pronouns. Me, you, him, her, it, us, you, them. Those are the pronouns that can be used as either object of the preposition or direct object. Okay, speaking of the one that Kruthi was talking about though, let's do that object of the preposition song because sometimes an object pronoun will be the object of a preposition. Here it is. The object 
of the preposition. The object of the preposition is a noun or pronoun. After, After the preposition, the object of the preposition. The object of the preposition is the noun or pronoun. pronoun. After the preposition. Kind of a country western tune. I think a little little jig is appropriate. Okay, let's do uh, direct objects as well. We're talking quite a bit about direct objects. Please sing along with me. D-D-O-D-D-O. -D -D -O. Oh, a direct, a direct object is an objective element that tells what the subject is acting on. D O D O. It's a noun or pronoun after a transitive verb. D O D O. It answers the question what or who after the verb and is labeled D O O D O D O D O. Okay, well, that is what we are going to be putting into practice today. Let's take a look at page 194. Could I have. Marcus, read the instructions on the learn it section. And you should be able to look at your own book too. Do you have your book open to page 194? Um, is this well ordered by much? Yes, it is. Okay. I check every time. Okay, 194. Learn it. Direct objects uh, complete the meaning of the action verb in the following sentences. Fill in the missing part of the compound direct object. Example, Dad watched Theo and the bullies in, in his fields. Thank you. So, we're going to fill in just a compound direct object. Um, sometimes it will need an article adjective to go along with it, like the boys. Sometimes it may not. Uh, in this sentence, it says Theo played soccer and blank near the new playground. What is a word that could be used as another direct object in the blank? Digshita? Basketball. Excellent. Played soccer and basketball in the new playground. Near the new playground, sorry. Number two, four little cousins played tag and blink on the blacktop. Tag, what could work in this sentence? Um, can I do number three too? Because I, because remember how I worked ahead? I, I came up with a really good one for it. Okay, I'll have somebody else do number two and I'll get back to you for number three. Um, Sahanas, actually, Josiah. Josiah, can you share something that the four little cousins would play? They could play tag and what else? Freeze dance. What is it? Freeze dance. Freeze dance. I like it. <laughs> oh, that puts a good image in your mind. Not just dance, but they played freeze dance. Tag, what did the kids share other than nachos? The kids shared nacho nachos and played slap during the game. Played slap? The one where one hand is like this <laughs> and you to slap it before yeah, the other. We can do that. So in that example, we're adding another predicate verb and a direct object, well, let's do that. 
sorry, this is an awkward angle to write. Um, so we've already learned about compound verbs. So in this one, we've got shared as a predicate verb and played is another predicate verb. And then nachos is one direct object and slapped is the other one. Shared nachos and played slap. Sorry, that's not low enough for you guys. So shared nachos and played slap. We added another predicate verb and another direct object. Or tag did. That was a good one. Okay, Harika, can you do number four? Afterward, Theo put away the equipment and blank into the gray crate near the wooden shed. What's another direct object? What did he put away besides equipment? Blankets. Um, put away the equipment and yeah, it could be some blankets. Medical equipment of rain and tape, April, April, Maybe they had blankets at the new playground when they were kind of sitting on the ground like a picnic. Okay, that is all for that part. Now let's analyze some sentences together. We'll start by reading it. Make a good mental picture of what's happening as well. And then we'll find some parts of speech in the sentence. Saha Nasri, would you read it for us first? Sentence one. Grandma helped the cousins and me with the project. Good. Do you have a picture of what's happening there? Picture in your mind? Yeah. Grandma helped the cousins and me with the project. Notice that word me. That's one of the object pronouns. Me, you, him, her, it, us, you, them. So we know that's going to be either an object of the preposition or an object, or well, it is an object pronoun. It's going to be an object of the preposition or direct object. Okay, now Sahanasri, can you start off by finding the conjunction? And. Good, and is the conjunction. Are there any prepositional phrases, Sahanasri? With the project. You got it, with the project. With is the preposition. Project is the object of the preposition. V is an adjective. Um, could I have Marcus find the subject and predicate verbs? Say that again. Yep. Can you find the subject and predicate verbs, the principal elements, we call them? Um, no, no, I'm just going, um, grandpa and the cousins. So grandma, let's read the sentence again. Grandma helped the cousins and me with the project. We only have one subject. What is it? Me. Well, me is not a um, subject, no. Mm. You try it again? One word is the subject. Who or what is doing something? Grandma helped the cousins and me. Um... 
Was it Grandpa? Grandma? Good. Marcus, do you have your book on um, open to page 195? I just did, but I didn't. Okay, Marcus, don't put it away until I put mine away, okay? Okay. Take a moment to open it to page 195 and keep yourself unmuted, Marcus, because I want you to keep helping a little bit longer. So grandma is the subject. It's going to be a lot easier for you to look in your book. And also, it means less for you to do for homework since we're doing some of it together. Okay. Okay, Marcus. So grandma is the subject. What is the sentence saying about grandma? Um, grandma. Grandma. What did she do? She helped the cousins. Good. So what's the predicate verb there? Helped. Perfect. Do we know what she helped or whom she helped? The cousins. She helped Good. the cousins. And who else did she help? Um, Grandma helped the cousins the person, and me with the project. I'm, I'm so confused. Wait, it's just it's me. And he. Yeah, me. You got it. It comes out so wrong. <laughs> it does sound funny, doesn't it? To say, yeah, she helps me. It makes it sound like you're talking about yourself. So, Grandma helped the cousins, that's a D.O., and me, the other D.O., with the project. D is an adjective modifying cousins. And don't forget to draw that arrow from your prepositional phrase over to the predicate verb helped. It's an adverbial prep. Okay, this next sentence is quite a bit longer. <laughs> Right? Ty, would you read the sentence for us? And I'll have you start um, helping with it as well. Okay. Did you gather from the floor all the felt pieces and cotton balls? Okay. Do you have a picture in your mind of that sentence? Yes, a pretty clear one. Yeah. Okay. Did you gather from the floor all the felt pieces and cotton balls? Does everybody else have a mental picture of that? Good. Now who, oh, sorry, not subject yet. Do you see a conjunction? Um, I don't see a conjunction. Okay, remember that the main conjunctions are and, but, nor. And, but, or, oh, hey, and, like, and, but, or, and, but, or. Two words. I thought you were talking about two words together. Yes, I do see a conjunction. Where is it? Uh, pieces, between pieces and cotton. Good. Hey, there it is again. Okay, Tig, next question. And this is gonna be maybe a little bit tricky, but I believe you can do it. Are there any prepositional phrases? Yes, from the floor. Good job. We usually don't have a prepositional phrase kind of in the middle, but that's what it is in this case. It's between your verb and direct objects. Okay. I personally think it would have been um, a better sentence if they moved that to the end. Did you gather all the felt pieces and cotton balls from the floor? This seems a little awkward. They might have even been doing this just to see if you could find it mid sentence but great job ty this are british because that's like the possible way to say it. yeah it's a little unusual to put the prepositional phrase in the middle of the sentence but it is definitely not incorrect this is a correct way of using a prepositional phrase we just happen to mainly put prepositional phrases at the very beginning or the end Okay, let's have somebody else help out. Thank you, Tig. Ariant, could you find the subject and verbs? It's 
subject and the verb is um so the subject is you and and um get gather is the predicate verb good i see a helping verb as well do you see it did is the helping verb excellent now what did you gather according to the sentence Dikshita, what is being gathered You gathered pieces and cotton balls. Good. So what? Let's find the actual object. Can you find one word for each of those? Uh, pieces. Good. So pieces is the direct object. Felt just modifies it. It's an adjective. What else is being gathered? A um, miscarna is it also modified with pieces? Yes, it is. And all is as well. Okay. And it's saying how many? All. And cotton balls. Balls is the direct object. Good. And cotton is an adjective. I would understand if you just circled cotton balls altogether. But it's better to circle balls as the direct object and what kind? Cotton. Okay, last step from the floor is an adverbial prepositional praise. Phrase, not praise. Put ADV prep to modify it. And that's all. You'll do two pages on your own, boys and girls. 196 and 197 including some proper and common noun practice and making a sentence out of some words here. Okay, great job. Let's take out our orthography notebooks at this time. And we'll sort in actually a, one spot as well. Um, we are going to start math a little bit late, but um, it is a very short lesson today. So I think we'll be fine. We're going to talk about subtracting time, just like we were doing adding time yesterday. Okay, 108 is our lesson for today. Lesson 108. Our first word was artificial, artificial, artificial. Marcus, can you find your um, orthography notebook? Next is February. Feb, ru, air, e. February. Yes, Kruthi? On what page? Page 64. Okay, Dikshita, you have a question? Then the last one is library. I don't have a question, but I know where to put the, like, like February's, uh, February's and proper noun, so I know where to put it. Good. Okay, as soon as everybody's done with these three, then that is exactly where I wanted to sort today. Great job, Dikshita. Um, is everybody done with artificial, February, and library? 
Okay, Dikshita, what page did you find it? 25. Great job, 25. We've got a page on nouns, including common and proper nouns. Marcus, can you turn to page 25? I actually wrote a couple of words with my 1130 class on this page yesterday, um, so we can include that. I wrote Greece as an example of a common noun, and then the homophone, Greece the country, over here in the proper column. And vehicle and vehicles over here for common nouns, singular and plural. But let's add February to the proper column as well. Feb, ru, air, e, feb, ru, airy. And library would be a good one to include here. Actually, let's do library. Yeah, we'll do this. Um, library and it changes to libraries with an I instead of a Y when it becomes plural. And then one more spot I want to write, synonyms, antonyms, and homonyms. I think we should have one more spot for a synonym on page 12. And I want to write artificial and counterfeit for that. If you don't have space, you can maybe just add it to the very bottom. Counterfeit okay. and artificial. Page 12. Marcus, can you turn to page 12? We're almost done, bud. Okay, who's done? Excellent. Okay, great job persevering. I know that took a little longer than usual for literacy today, but we don't have much for math, so it'll be fine. Uh, let's turn to our math notebook now, and we're going to talk about subtracting time today. This is also a good opportunity, though, just to stretch. We're in the home stretch, almost done. And let's do a little time warm up again. I'm gonna give a time for you guys to read the clock. And I'd like everybody to take out their notebooks, math notebooks, because that's what we'll be doing next. Simhita, can you read this time for us? One thing, I can't see the minute hand. 12.38. Good job, 12.38. Okay, let's get another one. After math, can I ask you a riddle? Uh, yes, I'd love to hear that. Okay, Alexander, I'll have you do this one. 
finally, I've been trying to get through. Hold on. It is 8 16. Good job. 8 16. Let's do another for our shop. Um, look, it's almost to the next hour. 547. Good job. And one more for Marcus. Marcus, tell us this one. It's almost to the next hour again. It's, I think it's the three yeah, yeah, fifty. Three fifty. Five. One minute passed though. Three fifty one. You got it. Good job. Okay, boys and girls, how did you feel about your math pages yesterday for homework? Adding time with regrouping and with no regrouping. Felt good? I figured that would be pretty easy. Um, today we're going to be talking about subtracting time, and we'll do some where we subtract without regrouping, which is just as simple as what we've been doing. And then somewhere you do have to regroup, meaning you're going to take some time away from the hours and give it to the minutes. So it's kind of the opposite of what we were just doing yesterday. So let's take a look at what we've got. Subtracting time. Okay, first, we've got some subtracting time without regrouping. Now, if you have a problem, well, here's a whole story problem about Mr. Jackson taking some time to paint his bedroom, two hours and 15 minutes. Then he takes an hour and five minutes to paint his dining room. We wanna know how much longer it took to paint the bedroom, and we subtract to do that. But notice that we don't need to do any regrouping because we can just subtract our hours, two hours minus one hours, one hour equals one hour, and subtract the minutes. 15 minutes minus five minutes is 10 minutes. No regrouping needed. Basically the same as what we did yesterday, but we're subtracting rather than adding. Alina? Can you do this one for us though, for practice? We've got eight hours and 45 minutes minus three hours and 20 minutes. Subtract the hours and then subtract the minutes and tell us what the final answer is. Okay, so first you do eight hours minus three hours equals five hours hours and then you do 45 minutes minus 20 minutes equals 25 minutes so the Good. answer is five hours five hours and 25 minutes perfect okay we're going to spend a little more time on this part subtracting time with regrouping Okay, could I have Kruthi read the little story problem for us first? Okay. Let's open your screen. Okay. Kyle, Kyle bikes for four hours and 30 minutes. Joey bikes for two hours and 50 minutes. How much longer does 
Kyle by Dim Joey. Um, I think I already know. Um, two hours and 20 minutes. Um, not exactly, because we're going to have to do some regrouping. So let's take a look at that. Uh, These are a little bit trickier. So we are going to subtract because we want to know what the difference between the two. So subtraction is what we use to find the difference. So we've got four hours minus two hours. Now we can immediately subtract those. But 30 minus 50, uh-oh, we can't subtract 50 minutes from 30 minutes. So this is what we do instead. We basically move one hour over to the minutes so that we're left with three hours and 90 minutes. And then we can subtract 90 minus 50. It equals 40. So just like in subtraction, when we have to regroup from the tens to give to the ones place, that's what we're doing here. Regrouping from the hours to give to the minutes so that we can subtract. Okay, let's put that into practice in your notebook now. Oh, Ty, you're making us hungry. Or making me hungry. Looks yummy. Sorry. <laughs> you're good. Let's write our header. Miss Gardner, may the fourth, may the fourth be with you all. I know Tag's a Star Wars fan. Is anybody else in class a Star Wars fan? May the fourth yeah, be with you. May the fourth, which is yeah. today. Miss <laughs> you are too, Marcus. Great. Harika, you too? Nice. Especially a Marcus, which one's your favorite? Well, my favorite is the Mandalorian series. Oh, nice. Who else likes the Mandalorian series? Yeah, they're very good. Harika? I don't like the series. I only like the movie because it has Baby Yoda, and Baby Yoda is very cute. And also, it's really cool. Oh, Baby Yoda is in the series. He's not in any of the movies, actually. Oh, well, he's in the movie Mandalorian. So, Mandalorian is, yeah, the series that we're talking about. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Nice. Dikita, let's write out this example, by the way. Seven I'm hours. A fan. I'm an Avengers fan. Oh, well, some people are both. Seven I hours and seven minutes minus four hours and 45 minutes. So, seven hours and 20 minutes minus four hours and 45 minutes. Before you just jump into thinking, oh, seven minus four is three, 20 minus 45 is. 25, ah, no, we can't subtract 20 minus 45, not going to happen. What we're going to do is regroup this one so that we have enough minutes to subtract from. Emma, can you help with this? Emma, can you unmute yourself? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sweetie. So we have seven hours and 20 minutes, and we want to move one hour over to the minutes. So if we're going to move one hour over, how many hours are we left with? Uh, 60 hours, I mean six hours. Good, we have six hours here and then we're gonna move that to the minutes. 
So we move one hour, which is 60 minutes over here. Now, how many minutes do we have? We moved 60 minutes over here and we're going to add 60 minutes to 20 minutes. Emma, what's 60 plus 20? Eighty. Eighty, perfect. We're left with 80 minutes. Now we have six hours and 80 minutes and we can subtract those right away. Do you see that? So now we have six hours, 80 minutes minus four hours, 45 minutes. Arshab, can you solve that for us now? Six minus four and then 80 minus 45. Six minus four is two and 80 minus 45 is um, 35. Good. And if you can't solve that in your head, 80 minus 45, you are welcome to write it out. But great job, Arshab. Two hours and 35 minutes is correct. All right, let's do another one. Specifically, we're going to do some ones with regrouping. Four hours and 30 minutes minus two hours and 45 minutes. This first one, if you're going to regroup, it's always the first one that's going to regroup, by the way, because we need this to have enough minutes to subtract from. Samhita, can you solve this problem for us? Walk us through the steps as well as giving us the final answer. Okay. So you have to regroup four hours to three hours and then 30 minutes becomes 90 minutes. Perfect. And then three hours minus two hours is one hour. And then 95, sorry, 90 minus 45 is 45. It's a double. That's right. So the answer is one hour and 45 minutes. Great job. One hour and 45 minutes. Okay, let's do one more. And I'll have you do this last one on your own and then we'll just go over the answer. Eight hours and 35 minutes. This is the one that's gonna be regrouped in the same way. Minus four hours and 50 minutes. I want you all to solve that one on your own.
Let me know when you're done, boys and girls. Give me a thumbs up if you're done with eight hours and 35 minutes minus four hours and 50 minutes. Okay, who's done with it now? Eight hours and 35 minutes minus four hours and 50 minutes. All right, let me wait another minute or two for others to finish. Josiah, are you done? Okay. Harika, what about you? Josiah, you're done now? Okay, looks like maybe there's a little confusion about this one. Okay, Harika, actually, could I have you walk through what you did for this problem? Okay, so I did, so I gave, took away uh, 60 minutes from the eight hours. So now we have seven hours and I added three, 35 plus 60, so I got 95 minutes. And then I uh, minus four hours and seven hours, and I got three hours. And I minus 95 minutes and 50 minutes, and I got 45 minutes. Great job, sweetie. Okay, so you're left with three hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. Who got the same thing? Great job. For those of you who are taking longer, do you see what she did? We always move 60 minutes over to the other one and add it to the minutes that are left. Okay, you're gonna be practicing this with your workbook pages today. It'll be very similar to yesterday's workbook pages, the same setup. You'll have a page of no regrouping. That should be pretty straightforward. Just no regrouping practice. Subtract the hours, subtract the minutes. And then the next page is all regrouping. And they give you the little number bonds for each one as well. So it will tell you when you have to regroup. And remember that we're always adding 60 minutes. When we move one hour, we add 60 to the minutes that are left. And the last one is a story problem. Rita takes three hours and five minutes to sew a dress. Tara takes two hours and 40 minutes to sew a similar dress. Subtract three hours and five minutes minus two hours and 40 minutes using the same strategy. Okay? Any questions?
Okay, well, it is reading group time, so I hope you guys all have wonderful afternoons, and I'll have just my King Arthur group stay with me now. Emma? Bye. Bye, Miss Gardner. Miss um, um, Gardner, can I ask you one quick riddle? Um, you know what, Sumhita? I was just calling on Emma first. So, um, and it might be I better since so many people Angel. have left, just I wait until tomorrow, you. okay? Okay. Um, so the problem. Hi, sweetie. Uh, Which one, Emma? The last the problem. Uh, we, do we have to do bar model or no? Good question. No, you don't have to. Um, because we haven't talked about how to do time.